Senate will come to order. Senator Miller. Uh, Mr. President, I impose a call of the Senate. The Senate is under call. Mr. President. Uh, Senator Benson. Mr. President, I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in absent members. To that motion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. The Secretary will close the roll. Members, please stand for the prayer. Today's chaplain is our Senate chaplain, Pastor Mike Smith of Redeeming Love Church in Maplewood. And following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning, Senators. I, I was um, in Florida, and I missed all of you so much. You know, as we approach this moment, we are considering continually the present-day war that's happening in Ukraine. And I found out last night, maybe some of you are aware of this, but the president um, has called his nation, every church, synagogue, temple, every mosque, he's calling them into prayer for their nation. So we join with that today. I join in this time of praying in that conflict, but we all face conflicts to some degree. I think of the conflict that Senator Tomassoni is experiencing right now. He's been a friend. He is a friend to everybody in this room. I always appreciated his words of encouragement. Um, he would always call me Rev, and, uh, and I learned to really appreciate that. And so, Senator Tomassoni, if you're watching this, we all stand in prayer for you today. When he was facing opposing forces that seemed overwhelming, King David prayed this prayer, and I pray it. Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? When my enemy comes against me to devour me, to take my strength, when they would attack me, they would stumble and fall. Though a mighty army would even surround me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I'm attacked, I will remain confident. The reason he said that prayer is this, and it's our prayer, one thing I ask of the Lord. This only do I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon his beauty and seek him in his temple. 
For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe, and he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. He will set me high upon a rock. So, Lord, as we stand in this place, we recognize the courage of the Ukrainian people to face an overwhelming obstacle. We recognize the courage of one of our co-laborers, Senator Tomasoni, to face his physical attack and conflict. And we find that, Lord, that courage comes from the presence of love. And we can face opposition when we set our face on the one we love more than the thing that we fear. So, Lord, when, when others are pursuing personal safety because of fear, may we pursue you because of courage rooted in love. And when others are trying to save their life because of fear, may we have the courage to lay down our life rooted in love. And when others give up because of fear, may we have an overcoming spirit because of courage that's rooted in love. And Lord, when we face the fear and uncertainty that grips the hearts of many, may we rise up with a courage that comes from your presence to have confidence that would be contagious, to have love that would be contagious. So, Lord, we are confident that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So we will wait on the Lord and be of good courage, for you will strengthen our heart. So fill this place today. Fill this room with courage and confidence and calmness because of your presence. Amen. The secretary will take the roll. Senators Abler, Anderson, Bach, Benson, Bigham, Carlson, Chamberlain, Champion, Clausen, Coleman, Swazinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Duckworth, Dietzik, Eaton, Eichhorn, Eakin, Fate, Friends, Gazelka, Goggin, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Ingebrigtsen, Isaacson, Jasinski, Johnson, Johnson, Stewart, Kent, Kiffmeyer, Klein, Coran, Kunish, Lang, Latz, Limmer, Lopez, Franzen, Marty, Matthews, McEwen, Miller, Murphy, Nelson, Newman, Newton, Osmic, Pappas, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rest, Rosen, Rood, Senjum, Tomasoni, Torres, Ray, Utke, Weber, Westrom, Weger, Wickland. Pursuant to Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40.7. Senators Tomasoni and Torres Ray. A quorum is present. Beginning with the second order of business, executive and official communications, the following communication was received. Make note, there is no action required. Moving to the fifth order of business, Reports of committee. There is one report to be read by the secretary. The secretary will read the report. Senator Rosen from the Committee on Finance, to which was re-referred Senate File Number 3372, a bill for an act relating to higher education appropriating money. Reports the same back with the recommendation that the bill be amended as follows, and when so amended, the bill do pass. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the committee reports printed in the agenda and read by the secretary be adopted. To that motion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The motion does prevail. We move to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate files. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 3063, 3472, 3003, and 3372. The Senate files are given their second reading. Moving to the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of Senate files. The bills listed in today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Moving to the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motions as one motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. Senate resolutions 107 and 108 are referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Senator Mr. Franzen. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 3923 be withdrawn from the Committee on Jobs and Economic Growth and Finance and Policy, and that an urgency be declared within the meaning of Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of Minnesota with respect to Senate File 3923, and that the rules of the Senate be so far suspended as to give Senate File 3923 its second and third reading in place on its final passage. And I request a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Mr. President. Senator Benson. Um, could I request an explanation of what this bill is and what the urgency is? Senator Franzen, or Lopez Franzen, I'm sorry. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, you know, uh, just yesterday, I think it was, in the Jobs Committee, Senator Pratt gave an eloquent and compelling argument about the urgency we face when it comes to the Unemployment Trust Fund. We all know the profundity of that urgency that we face right now. We know the cost to businesses, to our budget. We know the damage that that will do if we do not act soon. We as a body passed that. But we know it's a little stuck in the house right now. But there is an equal and just as compelling urgency that Minnesotans all around our state face today. And that's the need for frontline worker pay. We have 600,000 Minnesotans at home waiting for us to demonstrate our respect for them. Waiting for us to support them so that they can pay their bills. Those urgencies are both compelling and they are equal. And now is our opportunity to address them at the same time. When we think of the frontline workers, respect delayed is respect denied. We cannot wait for that and we cannot wait to take care of the unemployment insurance situation. Now members, we all know where we're going on this one. Let's be grown-ups and just go there. We have something that's passed in the House, something that's passed in the Senate. Let's put them together and take care of it today. Take care of it now. Minnesotans cannot wait for us to play around with these issues. Our businesses and our people need our support. They need us to act today. Reverend Mike today mentioned courage. There is courage in compromise. Minnesotans expect us to show that courage today. I hope that we will suspend the rules to have a vigorous conversation about this bill and that we will take care of business now and not wait another minute. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, I think it's important for members to know that Senate File 3923 actually replenishes the UI Trust Fund at a lower rate, members at a lower rate than what this body passed with strong bipartisan support three or four weeks ago. And that bill that we pass is awaiting action in the Minnesota House of Representatives. And we all know what's happening. Every single one of us in here knows what's happening. And we all know what this is. This is nothing more than a political stunt. Members, we did our job in the Minnesota Senate. We passed that bill with strong bipartisan support. And now the Minnesota House of Representatives is delaying action on that bill. And the deadline is March 15th. Members, the Minnesota House of Representatives, I don't even believe passed the companion bill for this. They haven't even brought up UI yet in the Minnesota House of Representatives. This is nothing more than a political stunt. I urge a no vote. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to make a quick point of clarification. This is the same bill. This is also $2.7 billion. It's split into 2.3 and 400, but it still comes out to 2.7, so this is the same bill. And I think that we owe ourselves and the people of Minnesota the transparency to acknowledge that maybe there's shenanigans going on in the House, but there are probably shenanigans here, too. So let's just stop it all and take care of it. Further, further discussion, Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, there are no shenanigans going on here in the Minnesota Senate. We passed a clean bill. We passed it with strong bipartisan support. 55 members of this chamber voted yes on that bill. 55 members. That's strong bipartisan support. Let's move on with the business of the day. Senator Lopez-Franzen. 
Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Miller, if you would yield for a question. He will yield, Senator Lopez Franzen. Senator Miller, I understood there was a conversation or a negotiation earlier today. Is that correct? On the issue of frontline workers and UI? Senator Miller. Mr. President, members, uh, yes. Senator Lopez Franzen. Mr. President and Senator Miller, what was the conclusion of that negotiation with the House leadership, the governor, and yourself? He will continue to yield, Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Franzen, again, the Minnesota Senate passed the UI replenishment bill. 55 to 11, I believe, was the vote. Strong bipartisan support. The Minnesota House of Representatives is trying to tie that to another issue. What we are going to propose and what we are working on and what we have discussed, the Senate Republicans, is instead of giving relief to some workers, and what I mentioned to the governor today and what I mentioned to the speaker is, let's put all the proposals on the, on the table to provide relief to Minnesota workers. Senate Republicans have a proposal to provide permanent ongoing tax relief to all Minnesota workers. All Minnesota workers. In addition, our proposal would completely eliminate the income tax on Social Security income. That's the Senate Republican proposal. The governor has proposed one-time checks. The House is very focused on essential worker pay. My recommendation was let's pass UI. We just heard how important it is. Senator Putnam just mentioned how important this is. We passed it in this chamber. Let's encourage the House to pass UI. There's a deadline of March 15th. That's next week, members. We did our job. We passed it with strong bipartisan support. The House should pass that bill. And then we should put all the proposals on the table, all the proposals, the Republican proposals, the Democrat proposals, the proposal from the governor, the House, the Senate. Let's put them all on the table. And then let's discuss the best way to give the money back to the people of Minnesota. Let's discuss what is the best way to put more money in people's pockets. So that's my recommendation. We can expedite that. We can speed that up. We can start having those discussions next week. But instead of picking and choosing some workers and not others, pitting some workers against others, pitting neighbors against neighbors, let's put all the proposals on the table so we can get money back to as many Minnesota workers as possible. Senator Lopez Franson. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the long discussion, but the answer to my question was not given. But I'll give Minnesotans the answer. The Republicans walked away. And they walked away from negotiations just this morning because they would not budge on tax credits and tax, tax cuts for the rich, the Republican GOP proposal. So Minnesotans, we are picking and choosing. And members, I encourage to support this motion and, and green vote. And I, uh, Ask for a roll call. Thank you. A uh, roll call has been previously granted. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate Senator Franzen trying to put words in my mouth, but that is absolutely not what I said. That is not what I said. Members, let me be very clear. Maybe I misstated what I meant to say. But the way we left discussions today is let's look at all the proposals all the proposals to give money back to the people of Minnesota. Let's look at every single one of them. If any member, we have 67 members in here, if you have a proposal, let's put it on the table. Let's figure out the best way to put more money in Minnesotans' pockets. Let's figure that out. Is that frontline worker pay? That's an option. Is it permanent ongoing tax relief? That's an option. Is it a one-time check that the governor's proposing? That's an option. So I, or Senate Republicans, did not walk away from anything. This chamber passed UI trust fund replenishment. We passed it with bipartisan support. The House needs to act on that. The next conversation is how can we best put money back in the people's pockets? 
and let's look at all the solutions. Let's have a bipartisan agreement to give the money back to the people of Minnesota. Let's do that. Let's come up with the best ideas in this chamber. But instead of picking one idea and not another, we need to look at all of them. We need to come up with a plan with the governor and the House, and we need to move forward on that plan. And I offered today to expedite that process. Senator Nelson's working on her tax bill. We're going to speed it up. We're going to try to get that done even quicker so we can have all those options on the table. So let me be very clear, very, very clear. We have not walked away from anything. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Miller. You have a motion in front of you which will fund the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund and take care of this long-standing months-old issues about frontline workers. I'm going to be voting yes because I want the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund funded and we can do that right now with the deal which will cause every business in the state to breathe a sigh of relief and every member of that frontline worker group to say, I was heard, I was respected, it is important. That's why I'll be voting yes, and I encourage every member in this chamber to vote yes so that our businesses and our workers can say, hey, they got something done. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, I want to first thank uh, Senator Putnam and Senator Lopez Franson for bringing this urgency forward. I think it's important for Minnesotans to understand and appreciate that we are, as a body, capable of moving forward with the commitments that we have made to people. Frontline worker pay is a commitment this body made to Minnesotans last year, and they're still waiting. I understand Senator Miller's argument that we should put it all on the table and maybe just wait a little longer and exert more leverage on working people and our businesses that are waiting for relief. And when we're done with this motion, and I hope we vote green, we're going to take up another important piece of legislation and that Senator Bach is going to bring forward. And I hope we're not going to wait on that one either so we can consider all the proposals. We are capable of doing more than one thing at one time. Frontline workers are waiting, 667,000 of them. We've made a commitment. We should honor that commitment. This body has already voted for unemployment insurance. Those two things are paired together because we know we need to get them done, and we should. And let's be clear. When Senator Miller talks about saying we should do something for everyone, that the proposal that came forward from the Republicans in the working group left a lot of frontline workers behind. The one that is before us now includes all essential workers, and we should put our vote behind that vote green. Seeing no further discussion, members, the motion on the floor is to withdraw Senate File 3923 from the Committee on Jobs and Economic Growth, Finance and Policy and declare an urgency under the meaning of Article 4, Section 9 of the Constitution and that this be brought, uh, brought to the floor so far suspended that, we'll, that the bill will be given its second and third reading. A green vote is to bring the bill to the floor. A red vote is to not bring the bill to the floor. This does require 45 votes for a suspension of the rules. The secretary will take the roll. I call on Senator Friends to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I report Senator Torres Ray votes aye. Torres Ray votes aye. Sen I call on Senator Johnson to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Tomasoni votes no. Tomasoni votes no. All members having voted, the Secretary will close the roll. 
There being 31 ayes and 36 nays, the motion to suspend the rules is, uh, does not prevail. Remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that an urgency be declared within the meaning of Article 4, Section 19 of the Constitution of Minnesota with respect to Senate File 3372 and that the rules of the Senate be so far suspended to give Senate File 3372 now on general orders its third reading and place it on its final passage. To that right. motion, discussion? Uh, Mr. President, Senator Miller. Members, uh, this is the bill that provides uh, research funding for ALS. It's a Thomasone, Senator Thomasoni bill. Discussion to the motion to suspend. Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to suspend signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. The secretary will give the bill its second reading. Members, we are on second reading. Is there any further any uh, discussion to second reading? Senator Bach. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. President, and members. Uh, for declaring an urgency on this bill uh, for my, my close friend, Senator Thomasoni. Uh, members, uh, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS, that was first diagnosed in 1869. And nothing really was done about it. Nobody really knew about it until in 1939, a baseball player in the New York Yankees by the name of Lou Gehrig came down with it. And then it all of a sudden got some life and some attention around the country as what we commonly refer to as Lou Gehrig's disease. But really, very little research has been done on it because it doesn't affect a large cohort of people in the country. And so Senator Thomasoni, uh, a week ago, when we held a tribute for him and thank all of you for coming and we raised some significant money for, uh, for ALS nonprofit at that event. When we talked about doing uh, an event as a tribute to him, he said, I'm only going to agree to do it if the proceeds go to ALS. So this members really is his number one priority. And there is some work being done around the country on it. Matter of fact, Minnesota is participating right now in th with three locations, one in Rochester, <clears throat> one in Minneapolis, and one in Duluth. We're participating in a trial platform called the Healy Study. And there are about <clears throat> 800 people around the country that are in this trial trying different kinds of drugs. And it's all being coordinated by the University of Massachusetts in Boston. And, but more of that needs to happen, and it's just been very much a lack of funding. And I heard we had just a wonderful uh, press conference on this bill a week ago, and to hear from families that have had loved ones afflicted by this disease was heart-wrenching. And to hear them talk about what they went through as caregivers was just one of the most emotional press conferences, probably the most emotional press conference I've ever been at. And because it, in Minnesota, it afflicts about 450 people. And that's been a constant number for a long time. Two people get diagnosed every week and two people die every week. And when I picked up this morning's Virginia newspaper up on the Iron Range, I noticed that a constituent of Senator Thomasoni's, who was diagnosed in December, was in the obituary in the paper today. So for some people that have it, there are different degrees of progression. Some are extremely fast, and other people somehow are able to live a number of years with it, and we don't know why, because we've just never spent the money to learn more about it. It could be very curable. Or there could be a drug regimen that can put it into remission. We just don't know because we haven't 
spent any money doing it. And you know, if you, like all of you, I'm a pretty proud Minnesotan, and we're pretty creative and pretty innovative people. If you think about it, you know, we, uh, there maybe wouldn't be scotch tape without us, maybe there wouldn't be sandpaper, there wouldn't be post-it notes, there wouldn't be rollerblades, there wouldn't be snowmobiles, all things that were invented by Minnesotans. And certainly our medical device industry, Minnesotans that work for our medical device employers have changed the health of the world here, right here in Minnesota with pacemakers and defibrillators and other medical device equipment that's been invented here. Wouldn't it be something to be proud of if Minnesota was the place that was able to change the health of the world for all of the future people that are going to be diagnosed with ALS. And, you know, I will never forget the day that, I, back in June, that Senator Tomasoni came, I went into his office because I knew he had been to the doctor on Friday, he was having trouble with his arm, and he told me that he had ALS. And he said, Tom, there's nothing they can do. He said, they told me to go home and exercise and maybe try to keep my muscle strength up, but no treatment parameters. So I think Senator Thomas Honey's hope and my hope and I think probably all of our hope is that through research, someday going forward, some other Minnesotan that's diagnosed with ALS, that the doctor will say, there's a drug and maybe there's a good chance we can put ALS into remission for you, or maybe cure it. But we're not there right now. So I can tell you, as a, in all the bills that I've carried over all the years, I don't think I've ever carried one that was more about hope. Hope. So that the, the, the next person that's diagnosed someday is going to have some hope for their family that they can have some kind of quality of life better than go home and exercise, there's nothing we can do. And then the second piece of the bill, the research piece is $20 million, and we've focused the language so that we get as collaborative a research as we can in Minnesota. We have great research institutions in this state, in Rochester and, and Minneapolis especially. So we're gonna try, we're gonna try and craft this so that People aren't working in silos on research, that they're working collectively together, and we create some synergy between all of our best minds in Minnesota on research, and they share that information, and that's the intent of the, of the research money to get, you know, for lack of a better word, the biggest bang for our dollar as we possibly can. That's not for me either. And then the, the second piece of it is something that was in Senator Housley's bill, and I want to thank her for, for authoring that. Uh, Senator Housley also has a, a bill on, on ALS with research money and uh, caregiver support grants. And if you had watched or seen the press conference and saw those families talk about what they had to go through trying to care for somebody with a debilitating disease like ALS, most spouses have to quit their job because the care is so intense, there is just no way that the family can have any kind of a normal life. So the five million dollars to the board of, State Board of Aging is to try and provide a grant program for caregivers so that we can train volunteers and family members can get some respite uh, from the, the daily toils of, of taking care of a loved one with ALS. And both appropriations you know, appropriations end at the end of the biennium, right? I mean, that's how we do. We only budget two years at a time. But these appropriations, we moved out into 20, June 30 of 2026 so that they go into the next biennium because we certainly don't want people applying for money just to get it spent. We want to make sure that the proposals that come forward are absolutely solid. Uh, so there is a, a longer period of time than what we normally appropriate money for in this bill. Uh, so members, I. And Senator Thomas only deeply appreciates your willingness to suspend the rules and the Constitution. We don't do that very often here. And uh, on behalf of him, I just want to thank all of you uh, for doing that. 
I'm sure he's watching us. So Senator Tomasoni, we all love you. Please vote green. Members, are there any amendments the president would like to move to third reading so we can have further discussion? Seeing none, the secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 3372, a bill for an act relating to health appropriating money for ALS research and caregiver support programs. Third reading. I do have a list. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support. Senate file 3372. Senator Tomasoni is all our good friend. We love him. I know we all do. I'm going to go back to talk a little bit how unselfish Senator Tomasoni is. When I first got to know him, he was on the other side. He was in the DFL, and I got to know him very well in the first couple of months. And I went to his fundraiser at the cabin party. And I don't know, I think most of you have been there, maybe not from our side of the aisle or the Republican side of the aisle, but I know many of you have been there. And Senator Franz and you were there, and several others. Senator uh, Newman, I remember, with being there. But I wrote a check to Senator Tomasoni for his campaign fund. And I had to sneak it into his, I think it was his brother-in-law or somebody, some person, because David would not take it. He said, you, Jazz, you can't do that. So I, I worked around the event and got a check to Senator Tomasoni's fund. And I thought I was pretty smart. I got that through, and they were going to sneak it through. And came back about five days later, and that check was torn in half and, and underneath my glass in my desk. So he got me back to it. So well, that's Tomasoni, if you all know him. But uh, Senator Bach, thank you uh, for your testimony, and thank you for allowing me for some input on the bill to make sure that this is a coordinated effort. A lot of times when these, months are, this, these funds are put out, we get into silos, and we got people duplicating work. And what I think the smart thing is to do is work together to do that. So thank you, Senator Bach, for allowing me to put that in, or recommend that be put in. Uh, I want to go back to David's uh, unselfish. This money goes to ALS. It goes to other caregivers. But let's think of the Tomasoni family themselves, what they're going through. So we're going to pass this bill today. I know the governor is going to sign this bill. But let's all dip into our pockets and get some funds to the Tomasoni family. That's what we need to do. I'm going to write a check today. It's going to have three zeros behind a number. And I'm going to get that to Dante to help the family, to help David, to help his family. We're going to help people that we don't know for ALS, but let's help our brother, the person we love, to get through this and his family, what they've gone through. So I'm in strong support, Senate File 3372. David, I love you. I know we all do. Dante and Danny to the family. In the six years I've been here, there's not one person more than we all love in this body, in this capital, in this state. So I look for your support on 3372. And if you want to get a check to the family to help David get through this and their family, for everyday costs they have to do, you can drop it off in my office and I will make sure the family gets it. Thank you. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. I, too, rise in support of Senate File 3372. Uh, as Senator Box said, uh, right now, currently, in the state of Minnesota, there are 450 people living with ALS. Uh, again, two people are diagnosed every single day in Minnesota, and two people die every single week. Two people every week are diagnosed. Two people die every week. Um, the press conference was was heart-wrenching. Um, we heard from Representative Ann New Brindley, who lost her spouse to ALS. A lot of us followed that on social media. Um, Jules Nigerian lost her husband, Paul Nigerian. She was there to speak with her three kids. Uh, Stillwater High School teacher and coach, Chris Engler, who is living with ALS currently, was there. Um, they all talked about what a, what a horrible disease ALS is. and 
what happens to the families. Uh, I'm very, very proud to, to have authored the other bill with the caregiving support in it. Um, they, need, they need respite care. They need, the caregivers need care. Uh, my hearts go out to Dante and Danny and their families. Um, our, our prayers are with you. Um, but I'm, I'm very, very proud of this bill and proud that there's going to be research and help for those family members. So we do love you, David, and um, um, our prayers are with the Tomasoni family. Thank you. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank Senator Tomasoni for making this happen, for making us wake up to the importance of this, to addressing the needs, and, and basically say how much Every one of us cares and loves. We all have our own stories about David and how even when he's on the other side of an issue, you know he cares, you know he loves you, he treats you fairly. I also want to remind us that the Senate has been hard hit because 10 years ago this month, we lost another beloved member, Senator Gary Kubley from Granite Falls, also to ALS. I think he, like David, was somebody that every member of the chamber loved, everybody respected, everybody cared about him. And how we have, out of a body of 67 people, have lost two people to ALS. Both of them, I think, models of what we as senators want to be. And I just want to say that, David, we do love you, and this bill is a good tribute, a good way to do it. We do hope other families get some help from this get a way to get around the incurable nature of this disease. And I hope that we'll keep this in mind as we look for how we take care of all people who are hurting with illness. Um, this is a good bill, and I appreciate it, and hope we all support it. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, Miyamano Tomasoni, uh, thank you for letting me be uh, on this bill with you. And Mr. President, Senator Jasinski said it, and so did Senator Bach. Let me back up. The good senator from Faribault and the good senator from the Iron Range said, said it most, that this is selfless. Tomasoni has always had a heart and still does have a heart that's huge. Not only was it huge enough, there's a picture of him taking out the great one, Wayne Gretzky, that I happen to have on, as my backdrop on a lot of calls I'm on, and people always ask, who is that and what is that? But this is about what the heart of David Tomasoni is about and has been about and continues to be about in the Minnesota Senate. And that's it, yep, we can do something better for other people. It's not about him, this is about other people. And that is, that is true mitzvah, what, what, what some people would say, right? Because he's doing that on behalf of other people. And there are many times that Senator Tomasoni, I'll never forget as a freshman coming in, he said to me, what you need to do is make sure you deliver for your community. Because Hoffman, it's not about you. And I never forgot that. And as I had a family member go through multiple surgeries, who would show up in the operation room with the balloon the day of surgery was David Tomasoni. My wife and my family has never forgotten that. And, and here's another example, Mr. President, why I support this bill, Senate File 3372, because this is about somebody in the future. This is about somebody other than any individual in this room. It's greater than that. It's a collective thought on what's good and what's right for Minnesota and what's good and what's right. And I want to thank Senator Tomasoni for that. I love you, David Tomasoni, and so does my family, and thank you for doing this bill. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to rise to add my comments. I served with David for over 20 years. And um, he was just always such a positive person. You know, you even saw it when we had the event last week, 700 people who'd all known him, worked with him, loved him for decades. Um, even as this illness, um, this horrible illness affected him, we'd see him on the bonding tour last fall. And he was still trying to represent his constituents, always with a sense of humor. Um, just an amazing person, and I feel privileged to have known him and worked with him for over 20 years. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President. I join in the chorus of those who've already uh, stood uh, and saluted uh, Senator David Tomasoni. I, too, 
uh, am excited about who he is as a person and for us to celebrate that. As we know that not only does he have a great smile and that he's full of courage and acceptance and encouragement, uh, I think he's also a jokester. Um, uh, um, uh, when a Senator uh, Jeff Hayden, former Senator Jeff Hayden was here, he and I were known as the Black Caucus. And so Senator Thomas Sony came up one day and he says, hey, I should be a member of the Black Caucus too. And I said, Thomas Sony, usually you gotta be black to be a member of the Black Caucus. <laughs> and he says, hey, I should be an honorary member because I stand with you. So he was always known as the honorary member of the Black Caucus. But then I told him one day, I said, wait a minute. You really shouldn't be a member of the Black Caucus. He says, why not? I said, because you can get out, but I could never get out. <laughs> and so that's been our running joke forever. But he always made sure that he had something kind to say to me and to uh, Senator Jeff Hayden. But I don't just stand for Thomasoni today. I, I also want to salute uh, 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 former uh, Representative uh, Richard Jefferson. Because as you know that he also passed from ALS. And, and uh, Representative uh, Jefferson was the husband of former uh, state senator Alice Johnson. So I just wanted to remind us of that and I also want to thank my good friend, uh, Senator, former Senator uh, Linda Higgins, who also made sure that I remember that as well. So as we think about putting a face to this uh, unfortunate disease, just, just remember uh, a, a cross-section of people who we are standing in the breach for, that we are standing in the breach for. And the last thing that I'll say is that love is an action word. So when we say that we love someone and, and stand for something, then we have to put that into action. And today, I join with my colleagues to put it into action. So thank you, Senator Bach, for your thoughtfulness and all the others who are responsible for uh, Senate File 3372, but even if my name is not on that bill, I stand today as a supporter of that bill as well. Thank you so very much. Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, I rise in support of Thomas Sony, and I think that's what we're doing here. And David, I know that you're watching this, and uh, you need to know that you were the glue of the Senate here. And others are going to have to step up and take your place. But uh, you managed to keep us together in a place that sometimes that's really difficult to do. And you brought a lot of joy here. Every day you were here, somehow you made me smile. And uh, we're going to miss you here. But uh, I know you're going to keep fighting. But uh, David, uh, we're proud of you. We're proud of what you did here. And I'm proud that uh, you did the range proud. David, you set the, the bar for whoever comes after you for the Iron Range. And I'm just glad that I could be one of you. God bless you, David. Senator Isaacson. <laughs> Much like my transition to the Senate was that experience right there. Senator Isaacson, um, it's your sparkly you. personality, I think. That's what it is. I'm taking my own, per can I take my own inventory, Mr. President? Is that okay? I don't know how that works. Anyways. So be it. Thank you. I, uh, I sat next to Jason Metza for two years uh, on the floor in my very first term in the House. And so uh, in that time period, uh, David Tomasoni became, sorry, the other body, my humblest apologies. Appreciate that, thanks. Like I said, the transition's still ongoing. Uh, I, I got a larger than life impression of David Tomasoni, and I want to share two experiences I had with him. Well, maybe three, two for sure. Uh, in my last term in the House, when I had made the decision to run for the Senate, I had a bill I was trying to pass, and I couldn't get anywhere with my fellow colleagues in the other body. And uh, I came over, literally hat in hand, and sat outside David's office for quite some time until he had a moment. And I, I snuck in there and I said, listen, I know you don't know me. I sit next to Jason Metz. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. But I want you to know that I have this bill that puts people to work. And one of the places it puts people to work is in Central Lakes. And it's this combination of dual training program. And he looked at me and then he tried to remember my name and he's like, wait, aren't you, 
aren't you running for the Senate? And I said, yeah, oh, it'll be in there, don't worry about it. Just like that. And it was the bill that I was working on that meant a lot to me because it was putting people to work, which was what my goal was with that legislation, and it made a big difference. So finally get over here, and much like I referenced, my transition to the House with, or from the other body to here was a bit rocky, and he was talking to me about how I had to be better dressed, because uh, apparently I didn't dress well enough. And I said, well, not all of us uh, can afford the nice new suits. Uh, it's a little expensive, and I'm a, I'm a professor. We're not making tons of money. And the next day in my office was a, a bag full of ties that he selected and he gave to me. And it was really generous, although I will say some of those ties clearly came from the 70s and you could use this kind of a breastplate. So I still have them and it's just, the thing that, that David taught me, because we didn't always agree on a whole lot, but he taught me how to have what I would say are friendly adversarial relationships, meaning that we could disagree and we could still joke around and see each other as people. And he really helped that point come home to me as something that uh, it was tough to see sometimes. And I feel like that was a legacy that he gave me that I hope as I go on, I can give to other people. So I really appreciate your mentorship, David. Thank you. Next up, Senator Osmick. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. I wasn't going to talk, but um, seeing as we're all talking about it, I just wanted to express my um, pleasure at seeing this bill make it to the floor, and I hope we have 67 green votes. A um, Couple of points. We tend to somewhat myopically think about this bill and how it affects Minnesotans. It's not going to just affect Minnesotans. It may not necessarily find a cure, but this is going to impact the world. If we can make progress with this terrible disease, this is going to help people not just in Minnesota, not just the United States. And that is David Tomasoni. Uh, I, I first ran into him in his committee. I think we used to call it the Frogs, Jobs, and Hogs Committee, sort of. And I sat at the end of the table, and I think Senator Weber was on the opposite side of the table. Uh, but we were, the, we were the least ranking freshmen, and we were right at the front of the table. Uh, but I learned a lot of things from David. And he's probably getting sick of people talking like this on the floor today, but you know what? We're going to do it because we've got you as a captive. You're going to watch this and we're going to say what we're going to say. Uh, but I learned a lot from him. I learned how to work bipartisanly. And there's a lot of senators I work, some, some of you I don't work with a lot, but there's a lot of them I do. And I learned a lot from him. Uh, and members, I want, finally, I want to talk about something most of you don't know about. Um, Senator Thomas Sony is now part of the history of the Senate, just not as a senator, but also as a president. And he's the 12th president or 13th, I forget what it is. Um, but he is now indelibly in the histories, the history of this body. Uh, before we started session, I asked all the senators that have been presidents, going back to the remodel starting of this, of this building, uh, to provide a piece of artwork for the president's office. The president's office is a, has huge amounts of wall space. The, our friends at the Historical Society only give us one. Uh, so we need to fill it up. And what I have started, and I hope this is a tradition, both Republican and Democrat going forward, is that every president that serves this body will leave behind a piece of artwork that represents them in the president's office. And we're waiting on one more piece, but we almost got it. And um, I'm having one painted specifically, depending on what happens going forward, uh, to represent me. But it, he gave me, he told me this is what he wanted. I'm going, you know, maybe it's a picture of something. It, go into my office, you'll see it. It's a shovel and it's a mining hat. And I thought to myself, is that really artwork? And I thought for a few minutes, I went, no. It's what represents David Tomasoni. And that's going to stay there, I hope, regardless of who the president is, to memorialize the folks that have done that job and done a very good job. So uh, members, I rise in strong support of this, 
and I hope we continue to embarrass him with more good comments today, but I, I know that he's not going to be happy we're doing it. Too bad, David. Too bad. Thank you, Mr. President. Next up is Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Bach, for bringing this bill. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Tomasoni, for giving us this opportunity to vote on this really, really important measure to help people in need. And it's so uh, in keeping, Senator Tomasoni, with uh, the spirit that you bring to your work, uh, really speaking up on behalf of those who don't have a voice, speaking on behalf of um, those who need the aid and the assistance and the and the, and the power um, that, that emanates from this chamber that you represent, uh, that you did so well and do so well for, for so many folks, especially those who are from your district. Um, I hope you're listening uh, so you get to hear all the things. I remember when Senator Speer uh, moved on and he got to hear all the things that people, all the kind words and all the memories and, and remembrances. Uh, he really, really enjoyed that. So I hope you're enjoying this. Um, it bears repeating, uh, David was everyone's friend. Uh, he was my friend. Uh, I love serving with him all these years. Um, so we're speaking of him in the past tense. We still serve with him. Uh, and I love serving with him. I love uh, his smile, like everyone said. Uh, I love the fact that uh, he could, we could disagree without being disagreeable. He really emulates the ability of the folks in this chamber to really throw the elbows and really debate and be passionate about the uh, values and the issues we represent and then go back into the retiring room and have a good time and be friendly and laugh and joke. Um, invariably, when we were up on our feet opposing each other, the first thing we would do after the microphones went down is we would walk over to each other and say, we're still good, right? We're still friends. You know I had to say what I had to say. Uh, and. And uh, it was all good. And in caucus, when he was part of our caucus, boy, oh boy, did we have some arguments. <laughs> Those were some, some really, really good arguments. But uh, we were all family, and we knew it. I have one funny story. I have many, many funny stories about David. But the one that I recall the most and the, very fondly um, is when I had a bill, uh, because I was really angry and mad at the DNR, and they weren't issuing a permit to do something in my district that really needed to be done, and they wouldn't do it for who knows what reason. And so I brought this bill to require that they issue permits. Um, I'll tell you what it was. It was to get rid of, of um, uh, uh, cattails that were completely overwhelming and invading a pond in my district, and we couldn't get rid of them, and the DNR wouldn't let us cut them down. It was crazy. Uh, and he was loving that. He, so so uh, I joined forces with David to gang up on the DNR, and uh, that one went down in history. Because usually, of course, I'm defending the honor and the integrity and the science of the DNR. And David was you know, really mad at the DNR, and we got to join together, and we cut those cattails down. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble, I remember that bill, and we called it the Bully the Cattails Bill. I remember it well. Uh, next on the list is Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is going to be a little hard. I hope I can get through this one. But uh, uh, I, I look at the, at the body this morning, and uh, 2003, uh, a few new senators walked in here that uh, are still here today. Senator Bach, Senator Rood, Senator Rosen, Senator Dibble. Let's see, uh, who else? Uh, Senator Tomasoni. Uh, and I suppose little did I know that uh, during the course of the next 20 years, uh, this guy that sat right in front of me, Senator Tomasoni, and by the way, Senator Tomasoni was always the center of the circle. And, and, I, and I'm just sitting here thinking a couple of minutes ago, my gosh, he sits in the center of the Senate, and that's just exactly where David Tomasoni uh, needed to be because, again, he was always the center of the circle. And uh, gosh, so many memories. My, I tell you what, uh, Senator Tomasoni, Senator Hayden, Senator Chizinski, and I saw, you don't even know what we wanted to, what we talked about in this little little pod here, but uh, we, had, we had some pretty good times, and David remembers those as, uh, a, a lot of going back and forth, uh, and that's that's the beauty of this place. We can do that, as Senator Dibble just said, and we can walk out that door, friends. And uh, 
And uh, tell you what, if you couldn't be a friend with David Tomasoni, you got a really problem. You got a big problem because he was everybody's friend, uh, and and we all know that. Uh, just a couple of things that you know, I, I'll, I'll never. I don't know where Senator Tomasoni. I don't know if you're going to be down here the last night or not, but uh, I don't know where we're going to go <laughs> the last night of session. If you're not, because uh, uh, a few of us always knew this little secret, we'd head off to his his office and. Uh, he had, uh, he had things in there that uh, I can't even pronounce, but they were good. <laughs> and uh, and uh, my gosh, you know, three, four, five in the morning, we were still there and uh, still kibitzing about things and, and having a good time. And the other thing I'll always remember about David is uh, when, he, uh, when he would have a bill, and not infrequently, Senator Tomasoni did not really kind of know the bill very well. And see, we, he would sort of mumble along and blah, 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 blah. And then he would say, it's a good bill. Vote for it. <laughs> That's all you need to know. It's a good bill. Vote for it. So uh, as we look at this bill today, and I was looking more, uh, more specifically, there are $115 million. That's all projected to spend in uh, ALS research in, in the United States of America this, in, in 2022. $115 million. This 20 million hopefully will make a great big difference. About 20% of the totality of, of, uh, of research in this subject is going to be uh, in the name of David Tomasoni and Senate File 3372. So folks, uh, as David Tomasoni would say, this is a good bill. Vote for it. Thank you so much. Senator Rest. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> um, Mr. President. Um, on two occasions, one in the House and one here in the Senate, I was able to welcome uh, Senator Tomasoni to the body. He started his uh, service in the House in 1993, and I was there already. And uh, uh, two years later, Senator Bach came and I was able to welcome him. And then um, in 2001, um, we, um, um, I, w I was, we came over um, actually together, but we then welcomed uh, Senator Bach. And they brought with them, um, their good habits and their not so good habits. <laughs> First and foremost, in the tax committee, Senator Tomasoni and Senator Bach put a number pri one priority on how taconite aid was going to be. Uh, uh, dealt with and whether it was going to come first or second with regard to um, LGA and what that relationship was going to be. And woe to anyone who did not agree with their, um, their priorities. Uh, Senator Senjum talked about uh, Senator Tomasoni's um, pronouncement about what constituted a good bill, and usually they were his. Um, but there was one occasion here in the Senate when we were doing um, a whole list of special orders, and Tom Senator Tomasoni had two bills, one after the other, and he got up and he spoke about this one bill, gave the number, spoke about this one bill, um, asked everybody to vote for it, I think we probably did, sat down, and then he had the next bill, and he said, you know what? Uh, the bill you just passed is actually the language of this bill. And he said, it's equally good, <laughs> um, although, because you've already passed it, just with a different number, because it obviously was not the same bill. and. Um, we, we all laughed, and he, he, um, uh, he charmed us. He, he and Senator Bach, on behalf of the range, um, have a penchant for 
carrying around amendments in their pockets, uh, whether they offer them on the House floor, or this House and Senate floor, or whether they um, uh, offered them in um, various committees, but mostly the uh, tax committee. And then thirdly, or last, um, uh, I think many of us on occasions have had um, remembrances of important events in our, our lives, our individual lives, celebrated with flowers from the Rangers. Thank you. Senator Weaker. Hi, Thomasoni. Thank you for being all of our friends. One member, actually Senator Hoffman, asked me a few months back, who do you trust the most? <laughs> most? We'd like to say we trust you know, everyone, but I thought about it for just a few seconds, and I, I said, Dave Thomasoni. You've always had my back, and I so much appreciate that. Good times, sad times, and just being able to share your open office, your hospitality, oh my gosh. Uh, Senator Rest just mentioned about Dave having something in his pocket. You always knew the priorities of his district, and he would have several copies. And you know, anytime, and he had something in each omnibus bill. And it might be the same object in another one. And uh, he was so passionate. And he is, Dave, I know you're with us. But talk about being passionate for your district and getting results. He delivered. Mostly it's, in addition to just being an outstanding advocate for his district, he was and is a decent, hardworking, Senator who cared about people and has a legacy now of fighting the war on ALS. What a legacy. I thank you. And uh, we're all eventually going to be up upstairs, I hope. I know Rukavina is wondering. And David. My Italian's not too good, and I know we've exchanged texts over the past, but I'll say, Grazie Babla, Dio vi benedica. Thank you, Dave. God bless you. Senator Nelson. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I rise in favor of David Tomasoni. Uh, I've known him for 12 years since I first came uh, to this body. But I have to say, our first meeting was a little bit rough. Uh, as a freshman, I had this idea about taconite aid. But of course, um, I was not an Iron Ranger. But he immediately let me know as I walked in this chamber, I think one of the first days after I offered this bill, uh, that there were some significant problems. And it was very clear there was no uh, room for negotiation there. But I have to say that over the years, uh, we have become very good friends. And I am glad to say that his joyful personality, I think, is much needed. And we appreciate you very much. We've worked on many things together. I want to mention the last one that we are still working on, Senator Tomasoni, and that's Senate File 980, that Higher Education Facilities Authority renamed as Health Education Facilities Authority. I will continue working on that, and uh, we just thank you. And I stand in strong support of Senate File 3372. Uh, the age that we live in is remarkable. Modern miracles of medicine every day are changing how we live, how we face diseases, and how we recover. And Senate File 3372 
with the research funding for ALS is going to continue Senator Thomasoni's legacy of giving to others and serving people well. I think this is a, a terrific bill. And Senator Bach, I thank you for pulling it together and bringing in research institutions that we have in this state uh, that are leading research institutions that have come already together and developed, excuse me, and developed uh, life-saving, life-changing treatments, and we believe that 3372 will do the same. Senator Herr. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the kind word to um, my friend, Senator Thomas Sony. And I would be remiss not to say anything because He's one of my fellow Pazan. And I did regret not being able to attend um, his event at the Carpenter Union because I have arthritis that day and you know, related to gout. So I know that there's you know, already plenty of funding for you know, gout research. And the Carpenter Union is in my district. And I can imagine uh, the room full of 700, uh, 700 people. So I just want to rise to say that um, when I came here in 2013, um, I have many mentors. And I learned a lot since then. I was a more grassroots senator, a community-oriented senator. And Th Senator Thomasoni is one of my mentors, uh, being that I'm his vice chair in the Environment and Economic Development Committee. So I know him to, to be a person with humor, um, know his background as a former hockey player. He's multicultural, speak several languages. And I can sum it up that he's very smart. But one day when I, I compliment him that he is very smart, uh, he turned around, you got to meet my brother Richard. He is smarter. So one day he brought Richard in. and. Both of them came out with idea that I should have a kayak club in my district using Phelan Lake, mainly because that kayak club, the Twin City Paddle Sport, would not have any, any other lake to practice. And they were searching for a lake that has no motor boat on it, and Phelan Lake was a suitable place. So they need my help to talk to the city so that we can make that available. And I see that as a blessing, because it brought and bring diversity, bring a unique sport that attract uh, folks, young people, that the new Americans in my neighborhood to relate to paddle sport. Because that is also a lead and a, a, a league to compete in the Olympics. And I know that a few members of that Twin City Paddle Sport did compete in the Olympics. So I thank both of them. And I, I thank his brother Richard and Senator Thomas Sony. When I compliment the other one that they're smarter, they, each of them point at the other person. So I, I still don't know this day who's smarter. But after all, they got the paddle sport into my district and using Phelan Lake. So, um, Senator Thomas, only thank you, and Senator Bach, thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, if I can have my way, I would vote green number of time, you know, for me, for Senator Thomas, only, and for the Pazan. So, thank you, and God bless you, uh, my fellow Pazan. Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks for the opportunity to speak on Senate File 3372. And thank you, Senator Bach, for helping Senator Thomasoni carry this bill. A couple things I just want to mention. Um, when I first got elected, Senator Thomasoni was one of the first people to, to give me a call. I hadn't spoken with him much before that. And like most of you said, he was a friend to all of us, and he was a mentor. And he really helped mentor me. 
I was just so, so shocked that this person from the other side of the aisle reached out to me and wanted me to be successful for my district. I think maybe selfishly he wanted to make sure I was going to vote for his projects, that he was, you know, dollars for his district as well, but he taught me how to think differently about how this place should operate, and I think because of that I'm a better, better legislator, and I think a lot of folks around this place are a better legislator because of things that, that they taught them. One thing that hasn't been mentioned yet that as I've watched around the room and I watched some of the DFL staff in the corner there that hasn't been mentioned yet, and as you look at the reactions on their face as uh, Senator Tomasoni is being talked about, the staff could probably come behind us and we could spend another day or two hearing their stories. Uh, Senator Tomasoni was loved by our staff, and just one funny story I won't, won't forget. Uh, we were talking about one of the copper mines, and we were going into the Environment Committee, and he had his copper mug that had his campaign logo on it, and one of our staff said, Senator Tomasoni, that's a great mug, and he just kind of laughed, and the laugh we all know, and he plopped it down, and he says, here, I've got, I've got 100 of them, you've got to have one, and several of our staff ended up with his copper mugs. And, just his kindness, not only to other members, as, as you've all heard today, but I mean, it's the staff that makes this place run uh, just as much as us. And I, I, I know that staff has the same affection for Senator Tomasoni. And I just wanted to add that piece because I know Dante is in the, in the audience today and he was loved just as much by the staff. So I'm glad we're doing this. I hope for people in the future that they don't have to go through this same pain that Senator Tomasoni's family has felt and that those in this body have felt. So thank you, Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, Senator Bach. We love you, and we hope that this uh, can help us get to a cure to end this. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Goggin. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank Senator Bach for bringing this bill uh, forward. I have a cousin that's been uh, dealing with ALS for seven years, uh, and the part that really got me was adding the caregiver portion to it. Um, nobody knows what families go through when they have to get the resources and the, and the, the support staff to, to help take care of their, their family member. And uh, so I want to thank Senator Bach and Senator Housley uh, for doing that. And, you know, I personally have been uh, donating to ALS for a, a long number of years. Uh, because it's, in my book, it's the right thing to do. And, I you know, we have the family members that are afflicted by different diseases, and so I always make sure that uh, I, I make those contributions to uh, research, but more importantly with this disease, it's the caregivers. And, you know, my wife has gone out to California uh, to help, and her sisters have gone out to help, and uh, her, her uh, my cousin's brother, who's a retired Air Force pilot, he actually has a plane that he flies family members uh, to California to help out with the care for uh, Cousin Pat. Um, I'm going to leave it with one last <laughs> story here. Uh, when we first got in the Senate in 2017, my uh, fellow freshmen were riding up in the elevator and um, in the Senate building, it's, and Senator Tomasoni was on there, and he has always got that infectious smile of his. And he gets off the elevator on the second floor, and he turns back, and he says, hey, we built this floor for you guys. And me, one not, not wanting to let an opportunity pass it by, and I said, how's that working out for you? And he just bursted out laughing, and like he always does. Um, and so it was just, that was a mark of a beginning of a great friendship with uh, Senator Tomasoni. And then uh, I want to piggyback off of Senator Eichhorn with the, with the with the mug. Um, so uh, when Senator Tomasoni became president of the Senate, he had coffee mugs made up. And <laughs> I went in to talk to him about a bill or something, and I saw the mug in, a, in his office, and I said, wow, those are really nice. And what's he do? He reaches down, he grabs them, he goes, I got hundreds of these things. <laughs> so so I, I just, uh, you know, his the generosity of, of Senator Tomasoni uh, is, is unparalleled. So I just want to say thank you to Senator Tomasoni, thank you to his family, and uh, God bless to, to he and all the uh, uh, unfortunate people that are suffering with ALS right now. Thank you. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this has been a great tribute to um, 
the person that we really love, and uh, Senator Tomasoni. And uh, it, it's been a while, and I have to say thank you to, to Senator Housley and Senator Bach. But uh, Senator Tomasoni's situation has reminded me of uh, what our family went through. Well, over 20 years ago, uh, we lost my brother-in-law, my wife's brother, uh, to ALS. And in those days, the difficulty was even getting a diagnosis. Uh, he was a Navy veteran. He had served in the submarine service. He was a, attended the University of Minnesota School of Engineering. Uh, following his naval service, uh, he was employed by Sperry Univac in their defense systems. And he designed um, naval uh, weaponry. And not only did he design it, but then he would go on board ships to ensure that it was being installed correctly. And when he started having these symptoms, um, you know, his family, doctors, you know, what's happening to him? What, we couldn't get a diagnosis. And we kept thinking, well, maybe it was something he came in contact with in those years he was in the submarine service. Maybe it was something he came into contact when he was installing these systems and, and um, afterward uh, we talked about some of the ammunition that had uranium-based uh, you know, particles in it and so on. We kept thinking maybe there's something environmentally that, that's related to this. Um, he was finally put in a nursing home and died about two months later and it wasn't until he entered the nursing home that there was a diagnosis. And uh, watch his uh, wife and son and daughter go through that experience. My wife um, tracking down crew members he served with in the Navy. Does anyone else have this problem? And so I'm just hopeful. You know, the word hope is uh, important for people in the future. And so I hope through this bill and the research that will be done that families uh, will get an early diagnosis and... and uh, we can find a cure for this terrible disease. So thank you. To the author of the bill, Senator Bach. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Those of you that have been watching me, you've seen a smile on my face the last half an hour because you all have really fond memories. You have no frickin' idea <laughs> what, what David and I have been through and uh, I, I just can't, <laughs> one, one of my favorites happened here back in 2003, and there were 35 Democrats in the chamber, and David and I were two of them, and the tax bill that year on the last day treated the Iron Range very unfairly uh, as it related to taconite taxes. We're the keepers of the tax. And uh, it was a, some, there were some really bad provisions in there that were frankly negotiated by the governor at the time and the speaker in the House and the majority leader in the Senate couldn't stop it. And anyway, it was a pretty bad bill for us. And I mention that because in my pole building at home, kind of my toy garage, I have some pictures of playing in the outdoors. And I have a whole bunch of newspaper articles uh, from over the years, mostly out of the Masaba Daily News, the Iron Ranges Daily Newspaper. And the one that I cherish the most between where David and I are on the front page in the headline is probably two and a half inches high in the newspaper back in 2003, and it says, Bach leaves DFL caucus. And right under in the sub-headline is, Thomasoni could follow. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking around, and he's freaking nowhere. Let me tell you, I'm out in freaking nowhere land, right? My, but my friend David was following in the paper. But it was we, we've just been so through so many things like that. So thank you for the last half hour because it's given me an opportunity to kind of reflect also on everything that we have been through and the great friendship uh, that we have. And uh, I can tell you, my wife Laura has worked for him for 22 years since he came to the Senate. And uh, if there ever was a relationship between two people that work together that are like a brother and a sister, that's it. And it's going to be a, it's, it's been a lonely session for her not having David here every day, I can tell you. But you know what, I've been thinking, many of us have cast a lot of votes on this floor. Uh, Senator Wiegers cast more than, and Senator Rest have cast, Senator Marty have cast more than I have here. 
but I've cast a lot of votes. And I've been thinking about, as we're going through this, what does this vote mean? Because this isn't a vote for Senator Tomasoni. This is a vote for people we don't know. And we cast a lot of votes. And as I've thought back, and today's vote is going to be a vote to help people that I don't know. And those really are the votes, I think, over the years where we've done that, that I feel the best about. And you all, I think, uh, should ponder that a little bit. This isn't a vote for Senator Tomasoni. It's a vote for Senator Tomasoni's vision and the courage of what he's going through. And his number one priority right now in his life is to help others. And that's a pretty remarkable legacy. And, and this bill will be, hopefully is going to be a significant legacy uh, in his time spent here. So please join me in casting a green vote for people that we don't know that somehow today we're going to be able to help. Senator Lopez Franzen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Bach, and thank you, Laura Bach, for protecting Senator Tomasoni from himself. And <laughs> I'll start with that because he is such an amazing character. I call ourselves characters. We all bring so much to this chamber. But Senator Tomasoni brings a special, special character that will never be replaced and that we will always cherish. And this has been a great tribute to him and to his family. And I'm lucky, along with all of you, that we've got to know him over the years. Um, as a freshman senator, he and I, I had my first fight on this floor with Senator Tomasoni. No surprise. It was about a bill that he was carrying, and he is notorious for putting his provisions in every single bill he can manage to do so. And I voted against it. Well, I think it was trying to put in a bill that made no sense, but I voted against it. And I'm sparing you the details of our fight, but I remember Senator Bach telling us to make up. And we did make up. I spent a while in his office talking to him about his district, about his career in hockey, and obviously I told him about my, my journey to the legislature, and we started to bond. And that bond never ended and will never end. The last text I sent him recently, I had a reminder in my phone of a picture of him at STEM Day at the Capitol with Edina robots and students, and I sent it over to him. You see, you love Edina. And he quickly responded, I have become Edina. Every day I need attention. <laughs> <sighs> we love your dad. We love this man. We love our colleague, our friend, and our mentor. And on behalf of the Senate DFL Caucus, you will always be part of our family. And this vote is for you and your entire family and all the families that are struggling with ALS. Thank you. Thank you, members. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Members, it's bills like this that make me incredibly proud to be a member of this chamber. It's days like today that make me proud to be a Minnesotan. Senator Tomasoni, I know you're watching at home today. This is a big deal. $20 million for ALS research? Another $5 million for caregiver assistance? This is a big deal. Senator Tomasoni, thank you for your efforts. Senator Bach, thank you for your efforts. Senator Housley, thank you for fighting for those caregivers. And all the members in this chamber, thank you for allowing all of us to have the opportunity to take this vote today. Most importantly, Senator Tomasoni, thank you. Thank you for giving us 
the opportunity to help you help make a difference in the lives of so many families across our state, across the nation, and across the world who are dealing with ALS. Senator Tomasoni, this one's for you. Members, before the Secretary takes the roll, immediately following the announcement of the vote, uh, the President is going to move for a very brief recess so that we may show our appreciation for Senator Tomasoni. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll on final passage of Senate File 3372. I call Senator Friends to, to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Torres Ray votes aye. And I call upon Senator. I'm sorry, Torres Ray votes aye. I call on Senator Johnson to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Johnson? Thank you, Mr. President. I, Senator Rosen votes yes. Rosen votes yes. I call on Senator Tom Bach to report the vote of Senator Tomasoni. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to vote uh, on behalf at Th Senator Tomasoni's request, the 67th yes vote for this bill. Senator Tomasoni votes yes. Tomasoni votes aye. All members having voted, the secretary will close the roll. There being 67 ayes and no nays, Senate File 3372 does pass and its title agreed to. The, Senate, the President calls a brief recess to the call of the President. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Senate will come to order. Senator Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills made special orders for immediate consideration. Members of the list is on your desk. First bill on special orders is Senate File 2666, General Orders Number 11. Senator Benson. Mr. President, Senate File 26. Six, I'm sorry, 2666 is a requirement that a syllabus be posted and visible for parents in a classroom. Um, during COVID, we learned a lot of really important lessons. One of the key lessons is that parents and teachers need to be partners in the education of our children. During COVID, um, during COVID, Mr. President, the burden fell more on parents in some cases. And as we move back to balance, let's remember that partnership needs to be strengthened every day because that is what's best for our kids. Every year, teachers lay out learning goals, 
objectives that are based on our state standards and their professional judgment. They plan their materials, their timelines, the order of learning. What this bill does is ask that they share that in a public way, easily accessible to parents, including objectives, materials, timelines, or order, so that parents know what to expect, so that parents can help assess how their child is performing and when their child might need extra support or when there's something to celebrate at home. So Mr. President, as we look to the bill, there are a few things about a class syllabi. In the first two weeks of a school term, the teacher of record must make electronically available to students and parents a syllabus for the class. The term of the class, an outline of topics to be covered, a report of the materials, including but not limited to textbooks, the order in which topics and objectives will be covered. During the term, and this is key, during the term, if that teacher, using their professional judgment, decides that modifications are necessary, they update that syllabus to accommodate the pace of advancement. If a class has something that affects a classmate and slows down their learning, or maybe they're doing better than the teacher expected because the class congealed and normalized, and they could move more quickly and add additional learning opportunities. What if something pressing, world events, or the illness of a classmate becomes a unique topic of interest? That gets included too. There are pedagogical reasons why a teacher might change their approach. For example, if they were teaching whole word reading in previous years but decided they wanted to move to phonics or reintroduce phonics, that would be included as a pedagogical re uh, reason for change. If a teacher of record changes, a new syllabus must be made available to the parents. So members, as we look at this, keep in mind we're not asking for day-by-day -day details. We're giving parents visibility to understand what their child will be learning in the month and in the year to come. We're helping our kids reach their full potential because parents can't do this alone and teachers can't do this alone. They need to be partners for the benefit of the child. And with that, members, I hope that this syllabus requirement becomes a tool to help partners and teachers be uh, teachers and parents be partners. Happy to stand for questions, Mr. President. Discussion to Senate File 2666. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will uh, give the bill its third reading. Senate, fi Senate File Number 2666, a bill for an act relating to education. Third reading. Any further discussion? Senator Weaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Last week, we discussed the first part of the parental rights, and this time, additional discussion about syllabi. I want to first reaffirm we strongly support parent involvement in their children's education. They should be actively engaged. Teachers welcome this, embrace it, and it's happening throughout Minnesota now. We raised questions last week regarding what districts, where, amongst the 850,000 students in the schools, you know, where is this an issue? And the response was naming a five or six districts, and I'm prepared to comment on those districts. I know it was a different bill, but it was a part of the whole Bill of Rights. The PTA, in a letter I distributed, the largest parent organization in Minnesota, 101 years, with two, over 200 chapters, they're opposed to the bill. I hope you read the letter. I hope you talked to members of the PTA. But the bottom line is they said, we work in partnership with teachers, with the big emphasis, with the T in PTA. 
And their message was, talk to teachers. And that is happening. Other groups also opposed it. Education Minnesota, you do have a letter, testimony from a, a teacher amplified that message. You'll hear more from a couple of, uh, of our members that have over a half a century of classroom experience as to the, some of the practical problems with implementing it. But I want to assure everyone that parent involvement Teacher engagement is important and it's happening. Also opposed for the record was the Minnesota School Boards Association, the Association of Metro School Districts, as well as the administrative group. They said they didn't need another mandate. It's being done. They also said, let's focus on the moment, the resources that are needed by our schools. More on that soon. In the press conference, and I realize this is a big issue, but in the press conference earlier this year, reference was made to the Rosso situation where a parent was being denied information regarding reading information, apparently a fifth grade teacher and it was in the Star Tribune, and it was used in committee that there's a problem in Rosso, Minnesota. And you know, I know the Rosso area, and of course, Senator Johnson knows it very well. Uh, but you know, just you know, briefly, I have memories going up there first at the upper Red Lake, fishing, going up to Bedette, War Road, Lake of the Woods, Rainy River. We got to know that area, love it, love the up north. And I also know the pride in that community. And when I heard the testimony that there's parents being denied information, I contacted the superintendent. And I asked, what is happening there? And by the way, I contacted a lot of other school districts. And as I mentioned, these groups, they're opposed. But in Rosso, no parent was denied information. And I can distribute the letter that I got from the superintendent. I could share a column from the Rosso Times. But uh, in fairness, I believe that uh, Senator Benson's offered an apology to the Rose So School District, perhaps having the wrong information. Because I was told, and I can give you the quotes, they said this was fake news. And there was a staff meeting. The superintendent wanted to know what is happening. They went to the fifth grade teachers. There was a great deal of stress that it was caused. I won't read you know, the letters because I contacted them. There were calls that were not returned. But part of the message was, we're five hours away, but we matter. In the Rosso School, it's one combined building. So the superintendent, he, he went right to, he wanted to know who, who denied information. No, it didn't happen. And Senator Benson, I appreciate there's an apology. I believe it's going to be in the Rosso Times at 1 o'clock tomorrow at the, on the publication because the reporter shared that with me. And that wasn't just in response where I was bewildered as to why, you know, in, in this rural community, uh, you know, parents may be denied as a part of the, the narrative for the Parent Bill of Rights. I reiterate, parents and teachers are engaged throughout Minnesota. Are there controversial issues? You bet. And parents have a right to answers, but just talk. Talk to the teacher. That was our testimony from a, a teacher in the Farmington School District. But the nuances in the, the syllabus requirement, it doesn't meet the moment. And frankly, it does not meet the needs that 
parents, that students, that teachers and staff are asking for our schools. What they're asking for are additional resources. Help is needed. Special education, let's start with that. Nearly 17 percent, 147,000 Minnesota students are in special ed. And unfortunately, Congress did not live up to their pledge to provide their match for funding. So school districts, and they've identified this as the number one priority for funding to fund the cross-subsidy that's done. If the cross-subsidy was addressed, and it's important for students with disabilities and for public education, for students all throughout, and their parents and staff, if it was funded, that would be over $800 per pupil unit. That matters. All of the groups that I talked about said, let's address this. They talked about the subsidy needed for English language learners. Parents responding to this bill said, we need to address the social emotional needs, the mental health needs, the cry for additional counselors, nurses, social workers. These were issues pre-pandemic that have only been exacerbated. The real issue facing us now is additional resources. And we can show that in the targets that we set for our number one priority, our public schools. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing what your budget target is, because I can tell you, and I hope you'll, you talk regularly with your school boards, there are budget deficits right now. We can start with Rochester, and you know, we'll go through all of those districts when the, the bill is on the floor after we see what the budget uh, target's going to be for education. So these are the reasons that people have said they're opposed to Senate File 2666 because it does not meet the moment of the real needs, the challenges that public education faces. I urge you to vote no and that let us focus on the needs of public education. Thank you. Um, Further Mr. discussion to the bill, Senator Benson. Mr. President, if I could just to the point of the Roseau schools, I'll deal with other comments um, in a closing. Um, I did misspeak in committee. The mother had taken her children from a school where she was denied the reading list and moved to the Roseau School. The Roseau School District was in fact transparent with her, shared the information that she requested, and so does my most sincere apology to Superintendent Jerome, his staff, and everyone at the Roseau School for my misspeaking having caused any harm to your reputation. And I did send them a letter and ask that my apology made public, but I thank you, Senator Weger, for raising it on the floor so I could make that public statement here. Thank you. Further discussion? Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm pleased to stand up today and ask that uh, this body supports our teachers and our educators and not add an additional burden to their already heavy load. I feel like we are caught in a crossfire of dueling legislation, of a national issue that's intent on undermining public education, school administration, teachers, and staff. This bill is the second bill that we've heard in as many weeks. It's distracted us from the urgent work that we ought to be doing right now to bolster and rebuild the infrastructure of our educational system, not giving airtime to unnecessary legislation. Our schools, our teachers, our district work and spend so many hours, hours upon hours, on their curriculum every single year. And I know this because I was a teacher for 25 years. 
I helped build those standards and those scope and sequence, connecting the different curriculum to uh, unique classrooms. I was there, I've done that. But I can't tell you how many times within our curriculum, within our lesson plans, that we have had to pivot for important events. Think about what's happening here today. We stopped, we addressed a need for one of our members and for the general public, and we moved on. Every time we do that, you've got somebody uh, nailing or putting this into the, to the journal. Teachers don't have that kind of time. Many of us would get to school before 6 a.m. and not leave till 4 or 5 p.m. Just trying to meet the needs of our students. And that includes contacting parents, communicating with parents, putting together the resources that they need that the next day or the next week, meeting with other teachers, building the kind of community of learning that we are all proud of here in Minnesota. And while those teachers might refine their curriculum points where they know lessons inside out, it doesn't stay static and as a result, our curriculum mapping and planning goes on and on. The bills that we are here, the bill that we are hearing today, the bill that we heard last week, are very important reminders of the need for transparency and communication and relationships with our parents. That's nobody is debating that for sure. But these are unnecessary mandates. There are already over 40. Uh, elements in statutes that remind us, require us to communicate with our parents as teachers. Yes, our teachers should and already do share their curriculum. If you are a parent and or a grandparent or a caregiver, over the last two or three years you probably have interacted on Schoology, Seesaw, Moodle, all of those different platforms. At any time, a parent can log into those platforms, view the curriculum, view the lesson, view the homework, see what homework is not due, sit with your child while they submit their homework. All of those elements are available to you at your fingertips. In fact, you can probably yourself go and download, download the entire curriculum of a textbook uh, that your student is using, or find an online book that they are required to read, or it's suggested reading. You can go to the, your school libraries and look up any book under any subject that they might have in there. All of these resources are at your fingertips right now. And yet, this bill and the bill that we heard last week are going to require teachers who are already overworked to do even more. Members, we have 114,000 unexpired licensed teachers in our, in our state, 114,000. So when we say that there is a shortage of teachers, that's not really true. We have plenty of teachers. Teachers who went to school, who got their license, who specialized in unique areas like me, library media specialist, or art, or social studies, or science, or math. We have all those teachers here in Minnesota holding license that are not expired. And yet, we only have 60,000 teachers who are working in the profession. That leaves 54,000 valuable persons, skilled workers in our state, but for some reason, and I think we all know those reasons, 
Our teachers are leaving the profession in droves, and this bill is an example of why. The perpetual unfunded mandates. And you might think, oh, it's so easy. Just go in there, throw a couple things on your curriculum, um, put a little note that we did this, we did that. Let's remember that these teachers also have lives outside of school. They're trying to get home to their kids. They're trying to get to their PTA meeting with their students. They're trying to spend valuable time with their loved ones, or the things that really bring them pleasure. And yet we continue to pile on more and more and more expectations. And I see that all the time in my profession. We saw how teachers pivoted in a minute when this COVID happened. Teachers that had never used these platforms jumped in and learned how to provide online learning. And it wasn't easy. Many of them were not comfortable with technology. They weren't familiar with online resources. But they did it, and they did it for your children, for our children. And this is not the way we thank them. This is not the way to insinuate that there is something that is hiding, that there are, um, un, un, uh, there are secret things or things that are in there that are going to have a negative effect on our children. And so it is absolutely vital that we listen to our teachers. We listen to the educators that we have still in the system. Because imagine if we really showed them respect. If we set the times so that they could be home with their family, if we provided the resources that they needed to do their job, if they had a manageable class size, if there were resources for our EL students, for our special ed students, what if every school had a library media specialist and an art teacher and a music teacher? That's what we should be talking about here today. How are we going to fully resource our schools? Not putting additional burdens on our teachers. And the reason is because there's this movement across the nation. And there's a movement to undermine our public education and put our tax dollars into other, into other sources of schools. We ought to be wooing the thousands and thousands of teachers who have left this profession because of the continual and the unfunded mandates and the seemed disrespect for the profession with all of the necessary resources. This is not how we thank them. While we were listening to that wonderful uh, um, tribute to Senator, uh, Senator Tomasoni, I, uh, I received a text from a teacher. This is a teacher, um, Elise, from Fridley. It's my, in my district, and she said, hi, Mary. I'm writing to you regarding the school situation and the budget surplus. In my opinion, the best way to use the surplus for the is for the kids and the teachers. I hope the legislature can work on the situation and do what's best for kids. That came in at 11.33 this morning. And I don't know what time. It is now 104. And my message is to you, to all of these members right here, right now. Listen to your, your, your constituents. Listen to your parents. Listen to your students. Listen to your teachers. And let's not waste our time on these nonsense bills that push a, 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 an agenda that doesn't even exist. 
And so members, with that, I ask that we be done with this pointless, distracting attack on teachers and vote for students with a red vote. Thank you. Senator Kwadzinski. Thank you, Madam President. Um, well, on behalf of the 12,000 students I had in my 33 years of teaching and the 24,000 parents, uh, I have a few comments to make, but my colleague, um, Senator Kunish, uh, I don't think I can be more eloquent or more passionate than she just was, but I, I do have a couple things I, I have to say. Um, I got kind of excited when I, call, when I first heard about this being called the Bill of Rights. Because the Bill of Rights to me is the sacrosanct thing uh, that the framers of the Constitution, when they all got together, saying, hey, this Constitution's pretty good, right? And they said, um, yeah, it's a bunch of things the government's gonna be able to do now. And um, the likes of James Madison and Ben Franklin said, well, but where's the list of things government can't do? Where's the list of things the government will never do? And they all stood around, and I'm embellishing a little bit, but nonetheless, they all got together and they wrote what ultimately became the Bill of Rights. Ten amendments to the United States Constitution that is a list, if you will, of things government can't do. Government can't do this, and government can't do that. In fact, the very first words in Amendment 1 of the Bill of Rights is, or are, Congress shall make no law. Congress shall make no law. And yet, this Bill of Rights, in Subdivision 2, twice uses the words that government must do this and that government must do that. It's a mandate upon the schools. The syllabus must cover the term of the class. The teacher must update the class syllabus. This is no Bill of Rights. It's a mandate upon teachers. And the work and the burden of, that they're already dealing with on a daily basis, as my colleague sitting over here, so as I alluded to, so eloquently expressed already, that it is an undue burden upon the teachers. And I do want to acknowledge that Senator um, Benson about her comments about um, teachers will be allowed to teach teachable moments. And teachers will have the opportunity to make a pedagogical adjustment to the curriculum. Because I do appreciate and applaud that, Senator Benson, that you acknowledge that. Because to me, that's priceless. Because my 12,000 students and my 24,000 parents who are probably perhaps listening right now would say that's something I did on almost a daily basis. I adjusted my curriculum based on what the kids were interested in and what issues were coming up. And when there was a school shooting, they wanted to talk about it because it's real and it's now and it's not buried in some book somewhere about some event that happened 200 years ago and yet those events are important. But to those kids right here, right now, right at this moment, they wanted to talk about that school incident or they wanted to talk about the Berlin Wall or they wanted to talk about 9-11. After 9-11, I spent, and I'll never forget that morning, a teacher, a colleague of mine, knocked on my door, and I was kind of a, um, you know, you don't disturb Swadzinski once the bell rings kind of a guy. And the, he, the, I said, yeah, and the, my colleague opened up the door, and he said, you might want to turn on the TV. A plane just flew in the tower, too. And I was a little bit hesitant because, you know, I had a lot of curriculum to cover that day. And, but nonetheless, there was a tone in his voice and a look in his eyes that said, no, I, I probably should turn the TV on. And just after I turned the TV on, I was explaining to the kids it must have been some guy that had a, 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 a individual that probably had a heart attack and, and the plane flew off course and flew into the, on the tower too. Um, and no sooner was I done explaining to the class what I think just happened when Tower 1 was hit, live. 
And I'll never forget that moment because I ended up spending the next two weeks talking about that. And not because it wasn't in the, it was in the curriculum, but because that's what the kids wanted to talk about. And that's what their parents wanted me to talk about. They wanted me to talk about what was going on. And the kids were coming, and they were coming to class looking for answers. And they wanted to hear from their friends. And they wanted to get things off their chest. And they wanted to hear what I had to say and what the historical precedents and on and on and on for over a week. And after the election of 2000, we talked about it. And if I was still in the classroom, I'd be talking about January 6th on the 7th and 8th. And I'd probably be talking about the war in Ukraine right now. See, the kids go to school specifically to their social studies classes to learn about what's happening in the world today. And so again, Senator Benson, thank you for acknowledging the teachable moments that occur, but that the teacher has to constantly think, okay, now I gotta update my curriculum. Now I have to go and update the, 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 the learning um, management systems. I had to smile when my Senator um, Kunish said um, the Moodle. I haven't heard that word in six years. See, teach, parents, they want to know what's going on in their classrooms. They, they, they're probably looking at this bill and going, this is a good idea. But the idea is already in, the, in our schools. We have Moodle. We have Schoology. We have conferences. Parents come to conferences to talk about their kid, one-on-one -on -one with their teachers. The portal exists, Moodle exists, voicemails, emails. Parents, thank you for utilizing those resources because we teachers know it takes a village to educate our youth. And it's a two-way, it's a two-team thing, the parents and the teachers. But I'd like to add an addendum to my dis debate, my words today, by I hope someday we have a teacher's bill of rights. And if that teacher bill of rights ever passes, I hope it has things in it like, um, here's what we're gonna limit class size. And here is, um, parents won't have to bring in supplies anymore, tissues and whatnot because they'll be provided for the teachers. And they'll have their prep time to be able to prepare their lesson for the next day. And class sizes will be limited. And they will have a duty-free lunch. And their counselors will have a decent ratio of 200 or 250 per student. And that our support staff in our buildings, which I never refer to as support staff because they're not supporting, they're critical to the needs of our teachers and our students and our parents. And um, anyways, I just want to again um, thank um, Senator Benson for bringing this idea to the floor because parents do want to be informed. The, 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 their, their ability is already their teachers and administrators and counselors and social workers are already following along. But um, anyways, I'll be voting no because of the, the, the teachable moments I alluded to. Thank you. Madam President. Continuing debate on Senate File 2666, the next senator on my list is Senator Claussen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam President. Well, I'd like to begin by saying that I support the use and concept of a class syllabus in every course. And as a former high school principal, I strongly support the right of parents to review what their children are being taught. Not only parents, but the public in general. Well, Minnesota Statutes 2020, Section 120B.20, which is the Minnesota Parental Curriculum Review Statute, already requires each school district to have a procedure to review the content and instructional materials of a class. And it also allows the curriculum review by parents that they could object to the curriculum being taught and there's alternatives that their child can, can access. Car parents really have a number of options to address curriculum and instruction concerns, and also a class syllabus. 
There are school district curriculum and instructional advisory councils to provide students, parents, and staff, and the community the opportunity to be involved in the decision-making process and guide the work of our schools. There are school site councils made up of parents, teachers, and students, which meet monthly. And those agendas, in part, are determined by the group members. The state academic curriculum review, it's a 10-year cycle, also has opportunities for public comment and also for the public to serve. Senator Benson's bill requires that with, within the first two weeks of a school term, the classroom teacher must make electronically available to students and parents a course syllabus. Well, my experience is that teachers provide on the first day of class a document, either hard copy, online, or both, which outlines expectations for the course including a review of how students will be graded, looking at tests, quizzes, term papers, science experiments perhaps, write-ups, and how much each of those areas will lead to a final grade. Classroom rules perhaps pertaining to absences and makeup work also included in the document, and a listing of units and topics to be taught in the class. These are often referred to as a class syllabus, or a course outline, or a course overview. At this point, will uh, Senator Benson yield for a question, please? Senator Benson will yield. Thank you, Madam President. Well, Senator Benson, in developing your bill, did you meet with a public school superintendent, a school principal, or a classroom teacher as you worked through and developed the bill? Senator Benson. Thank you. Um, Madam President, Senator Claussen, I did meet with a teacher, but I did not talk to my superintendent. Senator Claussen. Uh, Madam President, could you ask Senator Benson to speak up again? I could not hear that. Uh, Senator Benson. Um, Madam President, Senator Claussen, I did not meet with my superintendent. I did meet with a teacher. Okay. Senator Claussen. Well, well, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Benson. Well, Senator Kunish earlier kind of pointed out that schools currently have the electronic capability and do post class syllabus and so much more for students and parents. Schoology for grades uh, 3 through 12 and many other online commercial student information systems are being used by Minnesota schools currently to inform parents and students of their progress, their attendance, upcoming assignments and exams, missing assignments, uh, daily lesson plans, class expectations, learning uh, targets, their grade book, and class syllabi. You can actually go in and you can click on the day and you can see what is being taught in a class and what materials are being used. And school districts pay for these on a per pupil basis using general fund dollars. So many districts have been proactive in addressing the need for parent involvement in the teaching and learning process. And so you kind of wonder, is Senator Benson's bill really needed? And so I did a quick review. And let me just share with you some of the districts that are using this. This is not by any means a complete list. And I do know there are schools, because of resource limitations, are not using some of these online programs. But here's some of the schools using Schoology. Apple Valley, Rosemont, Egan Public Schools, Minnetonka, East, uh, East Central Schools, which is Finlandson, uh, Hastings, St. Louis Park, Chatfield, Washington County, Alexandria, Polk County Public Schools, Northfield, Orono, Goodhue, Princeton, Cloquet, Farmington, Barnum, Ortonville, Columbia Heights, Prior Lake, Anoka Hennepin, Duluth, Austin, Bloomington, Fillmore Central, Caledonia, Edina, Cannon Falls, Faribault, Pequot Lakes, Burnsville, Barnesville, St. Cloud, Red Wing, Redwood Falls Area Schools, Lake City, Waconia, Goodhue, Anoka, Grand Rapids, White Bear Lake, Lakeville, Pine River. That's just a sampling of schools that are using this and really accomplishing what Senator Benson's bill is all about. So I suggest one element is missing from Senator Benson's bill, and that's a direct appropriation to pay for the electronic postings of a class syllabi. 
What is being proposed in Senate File 2666 is an unfunded mandate. And the cost to bring these electronic tools are investments that our schools currently are using. And I think these are investments that as a state we need to invest in so that we can accomplish what Senator Benson's bill is all about, communicating with parents, making them aware of what's being taught in their child's classrooms. So as we move through the session, when it comes time to discuss a supplemental education bill, I hope that members will recall the discussion today and the necessary investments that need to be made so we're truly empowering parents. We're unfunding, we're underfunding our public schools. There's no question about that. We know we brag about 2% increase. Inflation is running at 2% or more every year. We never catch up. And there are things that, like this, these are new developments, these are technological developments that really help in communicating with parents, and they're costly. They're on a per-pupil basis, and they can, high, they can be as high as $4.85 per pupil in the district, and right now we've got districts that are looking at shortfalls, and that's why we need to look at if we're truly interested in communicating with parents and we're truly interested in allowing and open us to our classrooms. We have the tools to do it, but then let's pay for it. Thank you. Continuing debate on Senate File 2666, uh, Senator Isaacson. Thank you. Uh, in the last six years, uh, with another solution that's out there roving around the landscape looking for a problem. <clears throat> I think it's been well stated, and it is also well documented, that the underfunding of schools is not only problematic, but it's at a crisis. Uh, what we see in our schools and what we're providing for them for their education does not even come close to meeting what is necessary for them to be successful. Uh, and in some areas, it's worse than others, right? And uh, teachers support staff, paraprofessionals, anybody who's at the schools, anybody who's at the school that's responsible for making that educational experience be amazing is at the limit or beyond already. And I find myself on the floor in the Minnesota Senate debating a bill about syllabuses, not about funding adequately, not about bringing programs back, not about taking care of, of, of our special ed needs, not about uh, bringing vocational education back to the schools, not about the things we actually care about. I find us on the floor having a debate for the second time in as many weeks about syllabuses and reporting to teachers, reporting teachers and what their experience is with, with parents. <sighs> not that long ago, on more than one occasion, we fast-tracked money for business when they were in crisis during the pandemic. Not that long ago, we took a lot of interest in making sure our small businesses had everything they need and protected them and our, and our, and our workers to some degree through, through UI to take care of folks. When our schools, however, are in the same, if not worse, crisis situation, there's nothing but a couple of bills that add more mandates, possibly costs, and no more funding. Certainly don't do anything to, to take care of the uh, class size issue certainly just completely ignores it, probably the most pressing issue, which is mental health of our students, certainly ignores the funding we need to make sure they're adequately allowing for the classes they need, the technology they need, and not, not only that, but something we've long talked about, which is bringing career and technical education back to our schools. Certainly not paying our cross-subsidy. Folks, <clears throat> when our kids are involved, it seems like it becomes a political football. But when small business needs it, we're out there as fast as we can. And I think we should be. It's right to help our small businesses. But it's right to help everybody that's in need in this pandemic, not just small businesses. And we're not doing that here today again. How many weeks in the session are we? We know there's a crisis. We hear it from our teachers every day. I talk to teachers for my kids who are in kindergarten, first and second grade. It's a difficult situation. What we're asking them to do is already heroic, and then on top of that, we're gonna throw in a, a pandemic that's deadly to some folks. And we're gonna give them situations that are almost possible in keeping kids caught up because they have to be home when they test positive. 
We're asking our teachers to be on that front line all the time. It is one of the backbone, most important threads of our, of our culture and our democracy, and we act like we're just taking it for granted. No wonder teachers are leaving. No wonder there's as many te people who have teaching degrees and could be teaching as there are that are teaching right now because they don't want to be there anymore because it's not, they're not able to make it work because they're emotionally burnt out because we don't pay them enough. We don't give enough opportunity to be successful. We don't give enough training or hope or support. On top of all that, I want to share with you what I hear from some constituents demonizing teachers. This idea that somehow they're doing it for anything less than trying to make the world a better place. They cast uh, political motives. Listen, I talk to a lot of teachers. I'm in that profession as a college educator. Nobody gets in this to try to rule the world. Something to think about, but nobody does that for that reason, right? They do it because they want to make the world a better place because they have an intrinsic need or a call to help people find their way and be better than they were when they found them. I would encourage you to spend some time Go into a classroom, talk to teachers, talk to paraprofessionals, talk to the folks that are engaged in this process, and ask them, what is your experience? What is your day like? When does your day actually end? When does it start? How much money are you spending out of your own pocket for classrooms that you shouldn't be spending? What is your quality of life? That's what we should be talking about. That's not what we're talking about. Instead, we're talking about a bill that's yet another solution and search for a problem. I have to tell you that when I get those emails of people across the aisle, not in our district, but in general, it demonstrates two things to me that I think are profound. One, it demonstrates a sincere and utter lack of understanding of what teachers do every day. And two, it demonstrates a sincere and utter lack of why teachers do what they do every day. And the last two bills we've heard about that reflect that perfectly, unfortunately. There is not an understanding or a concern or an empathetic nod to what it means to be a teacher. And that standing up for teachers is standing up for kids and it is standing up for parents. They are essential as a team to make sure every child has a chance. And this bill is not getting that done. None of the bills have, and none of the rhetoric around it or in the press conferences I hear talking about tax cuts for whoever, none of that's addressing this issue. It is perhaps one of the most profound issues we should be engaged in, and yet we are not. So I, I will vote no on this, and I will urge my friends across the aisle to take this situation seriously so we do not cut our teachers and our education system, and most importantly, our future and our children to the bone any more than we already have. Let's do an about face, let's be bipartisan, and let's go make a difference. I'm just really disappointed that we're having this discussion yet again. Thank you. Continuing debate on Senate File 2666, Senator Johnson Stewart. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I just have a few things to add. Uh, I first want to affirm my colleague, Senator Swadzinski, um, in, and Senator Kunish. Uh, I stand proudly with so many other teachers. I've been a teacher for uh, about 30 years, granted at the post-secondary level, but I call myself a good teacher, and I frankly have a few awards to prove it. <laughs> uh, if you ask any of your children, adult or child uh, age, what makes a good teacher, they're not going to say, well, it, I really like the teachers that are not flexible. I really like the teachers that just teach us what they planned on that day. And there's no room for uh, meeting the moment, much like Senator Swadzinski talked about. You know, I teach highway design. I don't even teach uh, current events. And I will have a student ask me, I mean, granted, I teach college, so it's different. But as an example, I'll have a student ask me, you know, I was driving this weekend, and I saw this thing. What is that about? A good teacher will say, well, let's talk about that. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that I have won so many teaching awards is because, like, Swad, like Senator Swadzinski and Senator Kunish, Senator Putnam, I'm sure, uh, Senator Murphy, we have a lot of teachers in this room. We will take a student's question and apply it to their life. Now, I try to keep track of when I do that daily. I'll make notes to myself. And if I'm thinking of all my uh, primary school colleagues who are teachers, having to then translate that 
get it out to parents, I can't imagine anything more disincentivizing than reporting. I did talk to my uh, superintendent at Wyzetta Public Schools just this morning. I said, uh, Chase, we're hearing Senate File 2666 today. Do you think that's an effective uh, means of increasing parent-teacher uh, interaction? And he said, well, I think it's effective. I hope he doesn't mind I'm quoting him, but it's effective at getting more people out of teaching because one more time we're adding to the list of constraints on teachers when they're already exhausted. I happen to open up my university email just now and I see an email from a student right at the top. Hey, Ann, I haven't seen that you've graded that assignment from yesterday yet. <laughs> Students and their parents have an opportunity daily because of technology to interact with teachers, and it happens all the time. Senator Swadzinski, we don't call it Moodle anymore, we call it Canvas. And I'm thinking of when I was a kid, the way parents interacted with teachers and vice versa is we had a note pinned to our uh, shirt. I'm sure there's others in the room that are old enough to remember that. Nowadays, I, I can't tell you how many emails I get from students. I don't get them from parents because my students are adults. But daily, I, as a parent myself, I was emailing my daughter's teachers and staying in constant contact. Just one more thing uh, to affirm what Senator Isaacson said, who, by the way, is also a teacher. Uh, several of us went out yesterday to stand in solidarity with our teacher friends from Minneapolis Public Schools. And I was watching them, thinking of my own parents who were public school teachers and who struck for teacher um, contract negotiations back in 1970. I felt very proud to stand there. And I was looking at them, thinking these are the best people in the world. And what are we doing for them? They weren't out there with their hands in the air yelling, more teacher requirements, more syllabi requirements. <laughs> they were calling out smaller class sizes, living pay, just one job, support our teachers. This is not a way to do it. I am 100% voting no on this, and I hope my colleagues do the same. Thank you, Mr. President. Continuing debate on Senate File 2666, Senator Kunesh. Thank you, Madam President and colleagues. Um, I hope that we have all listened here today and uh, recognized the similar debate that we had here on the Senate floor just last week. And it still leaves me kind of dumbfounded. I'm dumbfounded that in the wake of two years of a deadly pandemic that upended Minnesota schools, this is what we're burning up valuable floor time with. I'm dumbfounded that teachers and parents are crying out for resources, not only to recover from COVID, but to simply educate our students. And that is what the Republican majority is telling us is the most important thing, and we must do it to respond to it. Unfortunately, our Republican majority lack the progressive leadership on this educational issue, and it's failing our students, it's failing our teachers, it's failing our schools, and it's failing our parents. This is not an education agenda that tells Minnesotans that we value public schools or that we understand how important our schools are to the future of this state. Clearly, the Republican majority is not listening to Minnesota. I'm a parent, I had three children that went through school. I'm a teacher and I'm a legislator and I am charged with advocating for our students, our families and our public education. And like all parents across Minnesota, I will always recognize the important part of partnering in my children's education and like thousands of parents across the state every day, I made a point of partnering with our families because I can and because I knew that was the right thing to do. It's not something somebody has to tell me to do. It's instinct. But it's also the law in Minnesota. Many of us have showed that. If the Republican majority is listening to Minnesotans, 
they would not be bringing things like this bill to the Senate and again burning our valuable floor time. A bill that is a non-solution to a non-problem they know already appears in Minnesota law more than 40 times. If they really listen to our parents, they would know that this is not an adequate response to the parents uh, and the things that they tell us. Why? Because parents already have that ability to partner with teachers and schools in their children's education. And they can already seek recourse if they feel the needs of their child are not being met. Parents like me and parents like, like the teachers of all of us already have the chance to give input on lesson plans that best suit their children. But despite DFLers, but despite that, our DFL Senate, uh, senators oppose this because they have listened to the parents. We actually spoke to the PTA, the state's largest parent-teacher organization, an organization with hundreds of chapters across the state, and they unequivocally oppose this, as do many other education organizations across the state. We have also listened to what parents and teachers and school administrators have told us what they really, really need. And they have proposals to address the problems our schools are facing if only this majority would allow us to bring them to the floor or to even have hearings. So to the parents and the teachers who have told us they want smaller class sizes and more investment in student mental health and school counselors on the wake of the pandemic. We hear you and we want to help you. To every school district across the state being swamped by special education costs, we hear you and we have the proposals that will help. To the thousands of teachers across the state who after two tough years are thinking about leaving the profession, a profession that I hold near and dear, as do many of our members, because they don't feel supported. We hear you, and we have those proposals to retain teachers and recruit people who want to join the honorable profession of teaching. In short, we understand that our schools need resources to help our students, our teachers, our families, and our schools. And we also understand that with a $9 billion surplus, we have an opportunity to address the real needs of our schools in a significant way. Perhaps the Republican majority plans to bring real solutions forward soon, but they haven't yet. And time is ticking. In fact, we are actively pushing and they are actively pushing a costly voucher program to further defund Minnesota's public schools by $178 million. That is $178 million that is badly needed in every single school in this state. Colleagues, this bill, like the unfunded mandate that the majority is pushing through today and last week, is merely a distraction. It's a distraction that Republican majorities hopes will allow them to say that they're actually really doing something for our schools, when in fact, they are not. It's drive-by legislation that ignores what really matters in our schools and to our parents, and they, they should know that. They absolutely should know that. And yet here we are spending floor time once again on things that just aren't even necessary. I promise you for our Senate DFL party, we will continue to push to address what we have been told are the real needs of our parents and our teachers in our schools and that we are listening. We hope that the Republican majority will join us soon. And again, I urge a no vote. For final comments on Senate File 2666, Chief Author, Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam President and members. The PTA never contacted me, but a parent did. A mom of a son with special needs, he's a senior, 
he signed up for a class in personal finance and investment. Special needs kid, wanted to learn how to balance a checkbook, how to make good decisions about borrowing money for a car loan, for example. He came home and told his mom about dodgeball. Wondered why they were playing dodgeball in a personal finance class. So the mom asked for a list of learning objectives. Got no response from the teacher. So while the PTA didn't contact me, a mom did. And I want to thank Senator Claussen for giving us not an exhaustive list, but a really good list of solid districts who are already doing what Senate File 2666 does. That is being transparent with parents about what they can expect to have go on in their child's classroom. Absolutely, those districts are engaged in a best practice. Absolutely, they took it upon themselves to make sure that parents had the information they needed to be critical partners with teachers in the classroom. So I applaud those districts who've already done it. So let's lift the floor, members. Let's make a best practice the expectation that every parent who has a child in a public school should have. I know Noka Hennepin does this. I know there are districts across the state who do it. And thanks to Senator Claussen, we have an even longer list of districts who are already doing this best practice. So members, let's lift the floor. Let's make it easier for parents and teachers to be partners. No exceptions based on geography, no exceptions based on zip code. We can do that today, members, because when parents and teachers work together, that's when we get the best outcomes for Minnesota's kids. And that's the objective of every person in this chamber, every person who goes to work at a school every day, and every parent who entrusts their child to a Minnesota school system. I would thank you for a green vote. Seeing no further discussion uh, being sought, we will have the secretary take the roll for final passage on Senate File 2666.
I call on Senator Friends to vote or to report vote members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Torres Ray votes no. Torres Ray votes no. Senator Friends. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Friends. Senator Franzen, Lopez Franzen votes no. Senator Lopez Franzen votes no. Senator Friends. Senator Bigham votes no. Senator Bigham votes no. And Senator, Senator Friends. Senator Fate votes no. Senator Fate votes no. I call on Senator Johnson to report members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Rood votes yes. Rood votes aye. Senator Johnson. Senator Housley votes aye. Housley votes aye. Senator Johnson. Senator Miller votes aye. Miller votes aye. Senator Johnson. And Senator Thomasoni votes aye. Thomasoni votes aye. The Secretary will close the roll. There being 36 ayes and 31 nays, Senate File 2666 does pass and is title agreed to. Moving to the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Senator Champion. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. And I know that the body's ready to go, but I would just like to pause for a moment and tell you about an event that's going on today. Uh, but I will also read a proclamation connected to that event. Uh, it's celebrating H Harry Tubman Day and the passing of this proclamation. That's going to happen today at 2 o'clock uh, in the uh, uh, rotunda. Um, here's the proclamation why I believe it's really important for you to show up today is that um, Harry Tubman was born on March um, in, in March 1822 in Dorchester County, Maryland, on the plantation where her parents were enslaved. And whereas, after escaping from slavery in 1849, Harry Tubman led th uh, hundreds of enslaved people to freedom through the Underground Railroad. She became known as Moses of her people through her social and political activism to help ensure that our nation always honored its promise of liberty and opportunity for all. And whereas in the U.S. Civil War, Harry Tubman supported the Union's forces as a scout, spy, and nurse to African-American soldiers on battlefields. And whereas after the war, she purchased a farm in Auburn, uh, New York, and established a Harry Tubman home for the age, which anchored the remaining years of her life. Her home and estate are part of the Harry Tubman Historical Park in Auburn, New York. And whereas Harry Tubman was an active proponent of women's suffrage, and worked alongside women such as Susan B. Anthony. And whereas Harry Tubman continued working for justice and for the cause of human dignity until her death on March 10th, 1912. She was buried with military honors in Fort Hills uh, Cemetery in New York. And whereas both Presidents George H.W. Bush and Barack Obama signed proclamations to honor Harry Tubman's work, life, and accomplishments for our country, and whereas on February 17th, uh, 2021, the U.S. Senate passed a Harry Tubman Bicentennial Comm Commemorative Coin Act requiring the Department of Treasury to mint coins commemorating Harriet. The Treasury is redesigning the $20 bill to put Tubman on the new note. The plan was first announced in former uh, President Barack Obama's administration. President Joe Biden renewed the commitment shortly after taking office in 2021. And whereas not all Americans experience the democratic process in the same way, Minnesota is fortunate to have a strong network of community organizations committed to promoting justice and freedom for all citizens in honor of Harriet Tubman's, Tubman's legacy. And whereas in, ob in observance of the 200th anniversary of her birth in March, we remember Harriet Tubman's commitment to freedom and rededicate ourselves to the timeless principle she upheld. Now, therefore, I, Tim Walls, governor of the state of Minnesota, do hereby proclaim Thursday, March 10th, 2022, as Harriet Tubman Bicentennial Day. That event is being celebrated at 2 o'clock today, and I hope that you would join us in the rotunda. Thank you so very much, Mr. President, for the opportunity. Senator Abler. That was actually pretty cool. Um, the Human Services Reform Committee will be meeting in 30 seconds. Thank you. 30 seconds, Senator Abler. Uh, Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. President. The Higher Ed Committee will be meeting in G3 in five minutes. Senator Dreheim. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Housing will be meeting in about 10 minutes in 123 of the Capitol. Further announcements, Senator Kunish. Thank you. I'll make it quick. On your desks, you will see that there is a little uh, flyer brochure uh, inviting you to a virtual panel discussion, Bring Her Home. In 2017, we passed the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Task Force, and last year we created the first in the nation Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Office. This documentary um, takes us through that process, and there's a QR code for registration. You can watch this online, and I would invite all of you to continue uh, learning and understanding the historic trauma of our missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just an announcement, there will not be a civil law committee meeting today. Further announcements? Seeing none, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, March 14th at 10, 10 a.m. To that motion, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? Motion, motion does prevail. The Senate stands adjourned.